Greetings. Today we're doing a Q&A video because we have been hard at work on the scamp doing some major maintenance and repairs. We're here at my parents' house where we've been working on the scamp. Thanks, mom and dad. And the scamp is almost done. It's pretty exciting. We are also recording an extended version of this for the podcast. So check that out in the description too. If someone wanted to live like you, what would be the first steps for them to get started? Cutting expenses, learning yeah. how to stop spending money. So just stop the outflow of cash and cut down your monthly expenses as much as you can. And then camping. Learn how to do your daily tasks, cooking, sleeping, not in a house. Just do everything as minimal as you can from the start and see if you like it. And then that way you'll figure out how little you really need to thrive. Any scary stories being out and about lately? We mentioned this in the last video. We stopped on the side of the highway in, I guess it was Eastern Colorado, and saw some prickly pear cacti that looked like it was ready to harvest. So we hopped out and we're seeing, it ended up being overripe, but we were pulling off the fruits and trying them out. And a couple guys got out of their mobile home, I guess, and were holding rifles over their shoulder not over their shoulders, but just like on a harness and watching us. So we just kind of played it cool and saw them and waved and they waved back and then we got back on the road. They weren't threatening. They weren't like acting as though we needed to get out, but I think they were confused. Like, yeah. what are these two people doing looking at the cacti in front of our property? It was very much public because it was right next to a railroad, so it wasn't like we were on their land. But Yeah, and we were not close to them, really. It was weird and uncomfortable, but at no point was I, like, threatened by them, really. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was weird. What's your favorite season for scamp life and also for general vibes? Yours has always been summer, right? Spring. Spring and summer. And then in the scamp, it's become... Winter, fall. Mm, spring. Well... Summer and winter. It depends on where we are. But mostly winter. What temperature do you think is the easiest for us or most comfy? 60s. Like 60s during the day and low 50s, high 40s at night? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's like the most comfortable sleeping weather. Even into the low 40s is still super comfy even without the stove to sleep in. And even in the 30s yeah. is comfortable. Once it gets down into mid 20s, then it's time to fire up the stove. That's when we start worrying about our electronics, right. which we will talk about in a minute. But with us three in camp, we can sleep in really cold weather comfortably. Mm -hmm. Van life versus scamp life. There's no real typical way, I don't feel like. Like everybody does it slightly different, but let's just answer it from a stereotypical perspective, right? So like, what is stereotypical van life and then what is it that we do? Seems like van life is more of a movement lifestyle. You can move from place to place a lot easier with a van. And it doesn't take so much to get set up. Right, they're built so that you can have everything ready to go at all times, it seems. Vans make it easier to stealth camp, so there's a lot more vans in uh, bigger population areas because you can stealth, you can sleep overnight um, in places a lot easier than with a trailer. A lot of people don't have a secondary vehicle. Like if I were to have a van, I feel like the first thing I would figure out is how to also have a motorcycle of some sort but a lot of people just have the van so they can't leave their van and then go to town to get groceries or whatever they have to drive the van to town and leave their campsite so then i think that leads to a lot more bouncing around and i think a lot, how a lot of people do it it would be more expensive than how we do it because if you're constantly traveling and only staying at a campsite for two nights max and then driving uh, to the next park or whatever it is then you're going through a lot of gas and there's a lot of flux whereas with Scamp Life, what we'll do if we're going to a new place that we've never been is we'll find a pretty easy campsite in that place, camp there for, I don't know, a couple nights, and drive around and kind of vet out the area and figure out where we would like to be. Then we'll find a cool campsite and stay there for a week up to two weeks. So the benefits that I see of having a van are, so you can turn the van on. So then you have your alternator, which is effectively, or the van itself is effectively a generator you can just turn it on and let it idle. And it has heating and cooling, assuming that you have heat and AC. So with a van, figuring out how to accommodate for different weather patterns and stuff, I think would be quite a bit easier because you can just run the van. Mm -hmm. So then you have AC and heat built in and power so that you can charge up a supplemental battery or whatever. It's all like self-contained in one yeah. vessel. So, and your protection from the elements is excellent. 
benefits of the scamp are that we don't have to take our whole house into town with us to get groceries. Since there are two of us too, it's nice that one of us can go to town and get groceries or go to the coffee shop and the other one can hang at the scamp. It's nice that if we have a car problem, we still have a house. Yeah, that's happened a few times where we had to leave this leave the Subaru at a repair place and then I would ride my bike back to the scamp. And it's nice that if we want to go do things, go bike ride or kayak or something, we don't have to take everything that we own with us mm -hmm. we can just leave the scamp and then drive to an area uh, i think there's a question soon about how we leave stuff what do you do to secure things while you're in town like solar panels has it ever been a concern i'm always thinking about it i think one of our primary protections is that the scamp is old and tiny and doesn't look super nice. So it doesn't look like it would be super fruitful to break into it. I mean, it wouldn't be. No. It's not. Because we take all of our expensive gear with us anytime we leave. Yeah. Going to coffee shops and working on our like laptops. Cameras, computers, even one of the batteries will normally travel in the car with us. And like our last few spots though, we had in total being two weeks there, we had two people come by. Mm -hmm. We park so far out that anybody who's going that far out and passes us, they are not out to come steal our stuff. How do you guys store your nice tech gear in extreme winter conditions? This is why we work so hard at constantly keeping the scamp warm. We could do really well in colder temperatures ourselves. Like Even we, down into the low teens. Yeah, we could stay warm with clothes and blankets and be fine and comfortable. But we have all of this tech gear that the batteries would be damaged if they were constantly cold. Really all we do is keep the scamp warm and sleep honestly, like with my devices. If it's really cold, I'll put my laptop and iPad in the bed with us. <laughs> And if we go to town, we will bring our tech gear with us and keep it warm in the car. It's kind of, it sucks that we have to baby all of our technology, but that's just part of making content and stuff. What do you do when you're cooped up during snowstorms? It's the best time. Snowstorms are our favorite. Yeah. It's the best to know that nobody's doing anything. There's something to knowing that everybody else is slowed down that mm -hmm. sort of takes the pressure off of us. Also, knowing that it's snowing outside and having a fire inside of this 13-foot trailer. It's so cozy. It's just so cool. And another added variable to this that is a little strange is that YouTube loves snowstorms. So it's always fun to make videos in the blizzards because people really dig them. So it's more exciting to make videos. If you could take a TARDIS and go back in time when you first started this lifestyle, what piece of advice would you give yourself and what item would you acquire that you wish you had at the beginning? Advice? I guess start the podcast. Would have been cool to have podcasts of when we're just figuring things out and don't know <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> it would have been a fun thing to reflect on, kind of like journals. I would tell myself that it's okay to be dirty, that it's okay, you're going to be all good. It's totally fine, because that was a pretty hard thing to get used to in the beginning. The item that I would acquire in the beginning would probably be the wood stove, because we started this lifestyle in the winter. With our Mr. Bummer heater, and it That was didn't brutal. work, so we just didn't have anything, and we didn't have any of our nice blankets or clothes. It was really rough, but we yeah. spent it. <laughs> Thinking about that just is like, It was how... too fun, though. We yeah, were we were having a blast, a high... but... It was haggard. It was so fun. <laughs> it was so fun, but I wouldn't it was do it again. I mean, I, I I wouldn't say that I wouldn't. Like, if we could go back, we'd... well, because now we know how to not do that. Right, and we have so the poorly. kit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is it difficult or stressful trying to work remotely with different places you travel to? We have the luxury of not working nine to fives, where we have to show up at a certain time, and we create our own schedules. And we so. don't really work as much with other people anymore. But it's not that travel is interrupting our work. Right. Initially, when we first started, and I was doing a lot of client work for like web development stuff, that was difficult. I remember one time I was launching a website, and you were out of town, and it was just me and the Mini Cooper in camp, and it was before we had decent solar, and I was almost out of solar because it had been cloudy. And then it snowed like eight inches and we didn't have the snow tires on the mini yet because it was like early October. So I'm snowed in. I'm trying to launch a website like from my cell phone and the client's calling me and I have no power to work with. So I was like running the car to charge the battery to charge my computer. It was, yeah. So then it was difficult. But now that we have it set up and we're working almost exclusively for ourselves, it's a lot easier to deal with. 
If money was no issue, would you stick to the scamp you have, get a new one, new type, or would you build and customize your own from the ground up? I want to say I would almost buy a Winnebago Rebel. Yeah, get a van. Keep the scamp. Yeah. Build it up and also get a van. Our kind of dream idea is have land, have the scamp be our house on the land, and then have our van be our travel vehicle. Our foraging vessel. So we could just go to the coast and harvest all the mushrooms and salmon and fish and... Stay out there for a few weeks, have our Suron electric bikes be yeah. our transport from the van into town to get groceries, whatever. But honestly, if we were to get... Even though I think the Revel is one of the cooler vans. That's a hefty price tag. Yeah, and I most of how it's built out, I wouldn't want it that way. So it's like... It'd be better to just start from scratch and build it out myself. Because truly, if we had the money to do it, like, would you actually? No. <laughs> so it's just a fun idea, too, yeah. really. We almost bought a new scamp. It was a 2018. Uh, we almost went and got it in Florida, but then I think they sold it to somebody else. But we would have taken that, gutted it just like ours, but it would have had a new axle, new windows, new, like the wrap for carpet wouldn't be. It just would have been kind of newer, but we would gut it. Because most of that stuff is just only useful for weekend camping at best. And the storage compartments and everything are lots of wasted space. So yeah, I don't think we would get a new scamp even if... The only thing is the ceiling height mm, yeah. would be really nice for me to be able to stand up. What is nomad life like with a dog? Challenges, pros, cons? What do you do with him when you leave? I think it would be really hard to transitioning to having a dog on the road if you had gotten used to not having a dog on the road. Because there are lots of limitations and things that you have to think about that now to us are second nature. We don't even think about like what are we going to do with camp because it's always... We've never had any other right. option. So we just always have to work around that. Like we were talking about snowboarding earlier. That's something that we haven't gotten to do much since we lived in this camp because what would we do with dog? And when we go to grocery stores, if it's hot, one of us will stay in the car with him. I don't know. There are times that we leave him in this camp, but it's gotten less and less. Because he just likes to come with us. Yeah. Like, if we're getting ready to go, he'll hop down and be like, okay, adventure time. And if we're going anywhere for long periods of time, it's to go do something outside where he would come anyway. Right. Oh, and with Airbnbs, it would be nice if occasionally we could get an Airbnb just to like do all of our laundry and shower and like clean up and edit a video or whatever. Just get an Airbnb for a night. But it's a lot harder to find Airbnbs that allow dogs. Oh. They're a thing. And there are lots of them, but there are a lot more that it would be a lot easier if we didn't have a dog for that. Does Camp get restless on bad weather days when he can't go outside? Mm-mm. He's really lazy. Dog hair management in the Scamp? Please share your secrets. We have none. We don't have any secrets. When he blows his coat, it's just everywhere. We, we brush him with a Furminator. We just fluff out our blankets more and sweep more often. Yeah. But that's all you can really do. How do you make friends while traveling, yet stay safe? I don't think I've ever felt unsafe making new friends. And whenever we get somewhere, I'll normally take camp on a walk and kind of get a feel for everybody. Check out kind of what they have going on at their campsite if they seem sketchy or... And make sure that they know that you're not sketchy right. and that we're not sketchy. And I always tell them if you need anything, shout. So that there's like some sort of rapport there rather than it being like you're scared of each other. Mm -hmm. But making friends on the road, I mean, we've made so many friends. Most of our friends that we've made are people who know us from YouTube. A good number of them, yeah. I make friends with girls at coffee shops mm -hmm. oftentimes. Just because we, before everything, went into coffee shops a lot and spent a lot of time there. This year has been kind of quiet in the friend making arena and that's been nice. And I talk to people all the time and if people seem interesting I talk to them so I don't really have any advice aside from ask questions and don't just talk about yourself. That's good advice. How do you deal with travel burnout? That sounds like the most first world problem <laughs> yeah, in the whole does. world. But and it's a it good is. question. I, but it is like from this lifestyle perspective yeah. i i feel like it very much is a real thing yeah it's a pain to always be moving and to never really have the consistency of a space that is your own aside from the vessel that you're living out of because anytime even if we are and we always are totally legal in everything that we're doing somebody can come up and be like hey what are you doing here and just bother us that like constant imminent it's not even a threat but just potential is obnoxious if there is anyone in the area who walks by if we've been there for a week and they're like what are you doing here or feels 
we feel that they don't want us there, we always leave. Yeah. Always. And some people, if and it always sort of corresponds to property values around. There's more of a sense of kind of a right to that land, the public the, land. The one summer where we were moving the most rapidly that we've ever moved. I mean, we even went back to Kansas City for a second, but we went from with a scamp Eastern Colorado up to Washington and then down to Oregon in like a matter of two months. I definitely felt burnt out doing all of that, especially with a scamp because you can't stealth as easily if you want to just stay in a spot overnight quickly and then leave the next day. With a trailer, it's a lot harder to do than a van. And in a van, everything is all ready to go and packed up. So if you're doing a lot of movement, that would have been so much easier. That's part of why we travel so slowly though, because it's so much less stressful. It used to be so stressful traveling to a new place and figuring out where to camp and stuff. We would dread moving, yeah. but it had a lot to do with the Mini not being the most capable vehicle we've right. had. And when the Subaru is in like having any kind of issues, if it's overheating or whatever, that's also something. But now that we're better at finding places to camp and everything, it's kind of really fun to go to a new place. I don't know, it's all about the mood that we have going into it. Mm -hmm. If we're like, oh, this is gonna be so hard, uh, uh, and we're like Did negative, it then it's awful. But if we just take our time and like don't rush it and uh, don't panic, then everything's always good. If we're feeling like we are moving too much, we stop or we go <laughs> get an Airbnb. Yeah, but we've got an Airbnb like- Three times. Ever, yeah. In four years. Yeah. So I guess, we don't do that often, but it's a good option. Yeah, it's always there. Do you plan on living in a scamp for much longer? What are your long-term living plans? It's hard to plan. We don't really have a plan. I don't see myself living anywhere else anytime soon. Kids, what happens to this lifestyle if you have kids? They don't just happen out of nowhere. Yeah, you gotta like do some stuff to make it happen. So when you do stuff, be careful about doing stuff and then you could not have them. So when we do have them, our lifestyle will probably be different and we will be more accommodating to the changes that would be necessary for kids. Yeah. What's one thing, if any, that you miss from living in a fixed location? My go-to is a, a hot shower on demand. It's not necessarily that I miss it, but that's what I appreciate most when I come back. I like to just be able to chill and know that nobody's gonna jack with me. Like know that no ranger's gonna come by and be like, hey, what's going on here? You know, there's a 14 day limit. Yes, I do, thank you. You know, and generally they're really awesome and cool, nice men and women, but just having that like looming, I don't know, makes it so that it's hard to chill sometimes. Biggest fear living this way. I wasn't gonna include this question because I don't like focusing on the fear of this. I think there's a general assumption that this is scary. I think people are scared of animals a lot of times, like bears, for example, that always comes up. I guess people are a rational thing to be scared of, but generally the people that are out in the woods are good people and they're pretty laid back and not scary people. I think if you contrast this with living in a city, for example, it may seem like superficially scary, but there, if we're thinking about it from a rational perspective, there's a lot more, a lot higher threat in a city than there is in the woods. I guess I would say I have been most scared of the idea of a forest fire or a flash flood taking us out in my sleep. And waking up to, in the middle of the night to a major thunderstorm has been terrifying in the past. Favorite thing you've learned about yourselves or each other while living in the scamp? I feel like I've noticed you from the beginning are so paternal. Like your paternal aspects have come out this way because you are very much like protector and navigator through everything. Like not only protecting me, but just being, you're very much a leader and that's been evident from the beginning of this. Yeah, I feel like a lot of times I can't click out of dad mode. Like when we're hanging with a bunch of friends and stuff, it's, I'm always trying to predict what bad thing could happen, <laughs> trying to protect against that. What I've learned about you, you're really tough. Nothing really rattles you anymore. Or like you get superficially rattled sometimes, but like none of the, <laughs> none of the like big things really shake you. It's like, okay, so now we deal with this rather than being like, ah! <laughs> How did quarantine influence your relationship? I thought it was awesome. I loved it. Because we had a reason to be stuck together. <laughs> right? Like, it, it wasn't like we're just stuck together. It was like, okay, this is, a, this is weird. And yeah, we are stuck we gotta together. We got to figure this out. And uh, the fact that everybody else slowed down kind of like took the foot off of the pedal, you know? 
Like, we can slow down, too. Well, because we generally are slowed down, but it feels this, there's always a sense that we need to be hustling right. because everyone else is. So then when nobody else was, it was like, oh, sweet, this is our natural state, and now the pressure is off. And when the pressure is off, it feels like I feel like I can create more easily and better yeah. things because there's not so much pressure. In terms of relationship, we had been practicing living like this for a long time. So it wasn't really a big shift to be close together for long periods of time. Yeah, I mean, with our relationship, it didn't change. There was like nothing changed for us really on a personal level. We couldn't go to the coffee shops, I guess. So if one of us wanted to go to town and work, we couldn't do that. We had to figure out power and everything, but that really didn't, it was all good. I feel like this lifestyle is the best test for a relationship. Either gonna make you realize that you are a great team and that you are committed to continuing to be a great team, or that maybe you're not the best team. <laughs> Biggest challenge, worst problem living in this camp. Probably, like I said earlier, learning how to be dirty. And how to how to not get dirty too. Mm -hmm. Like how to use layers if you start to get hot, peel layers. And learning that it's a lot easier to wash off my body than it is to do laundry. So like not wearing a shirt when I get hot and then I can just shower off or jump in the creek and then clean myself off. I think he, dealing with moisture is difficult and continues to be. That's why we like arid environments more. What are some things that were extremely unexpected or challenging at first, but you've grown to love and appreciate? Cold weather. I guess we didn't not expect cold weather. Like it wasn't like, mm -hmm. oh my God, it's snowing in Colorado at 10,000 feet. But it was extremely challenging at yeah, first. Yeah, it was. And I didn't really appreciate it very much. I appreciate it now because nobody else likes cold weather. So we get camping areas to ourselves, forest land completely to ourselves. Well, that's the end of our questions. That was kind of fun. Remember too that we have an accompany accompanying podcast. So if you want to hear a little bit more detail on some questions that we probably didn't go into in the video, we have a podcast that will go through all of it. Next time you see us, we will probably be back in the scamp. Yay. Cool. Well, thanks for watching. Bye.